monarchs, and who will be speaking about uh, Baha'u'llah's writings to Napoleon III, Queen Victoria, and I believe Tsar Alexander, if I remember right. And then in March, Sunday to March the 6th, we will have a panel, symposium panel on Baha'i epistemology. How do we know things um, in the world and uh, how do we know whether something is true or not with three Baha'i speakers, Jean-Marc Lepin, uh, Jack McLean, and Peter Terry. We're looking forward to that. We also have three courses that all start tomorrow. All three of them are available through Graduate Theological Union for credit. And the first two are also available not for credit through the Roman Institute's own website, Baha'i Theology, Introduction to the Study of Baha'u'llah's Writings, and Reconstructing Blackness, Anti-Racism and Unity in the American uh, Baha'i Community and, and the US in general. So those are very interesting courses and people can still register for the non-credit versions of them. Uh, on our website. <clears throat> Turning now to introduce Julia Berger, whom I am delighted uh, to have on our program today. A friend of mine, actually, for many, many years, we've been exchanging emails probably for close to 20 years, it seems to me, Julia, from when you were at the United Nations as the principal researcher for the Baha'i International Community, and we would be writing back and forth about various topics related to religious studies at that time. Uh, okay. She since then completed her PhD from the University of Kent in the United Kingdom uh, in the Theology and Religious Studies program. She also previously had a Master of Education from International Development and Education at the University of Toronto. She's currently an affiliate faculty member at the Department of Religion at Montclair Saint State University in Montclair, New Jersey. Her presentation day comes, today comes from her book, Rethinking Religion and Politics in the Plural World, published just this last year by the academic publisher Bloomsbury, and it explores the changing role of religion in the international arena with particular attention to insights emerging from the Baha'i community's engagement with the United Nations. So as you can imagine, her, doc her doctorate and her book both stem very much from her work for the Baha'i international community at the United Nations. And we are delighted today to be hearing more about this topic and how the Baha'is have been able to contribute to discourse at the UN and how that discourse has continued to develop. So Julia, welcome and thank you again for joining us. I'll turn off my camera and microphone and turn off my screen sharing and we will turn the program over to you. So thank you again and we look forward to hearing, hearing your voice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rob. So good afternoon, good good meet, good evening, wherever you are. And again, um, thank you to Rob for that uh, very warm welcome and to the Wilmette Institute for inviting me and for giving me this opportunity to share some of the findings from research about the Baha'i international community in the international arena. I'm very much looking forward to, um, to sharing some of those insights with you all. I'm going to start by sharing my screen and um, here we are. I hope everyone can see. Um, Looks good. Sorry, actually, I'm. Uh, so you should be seeing the first slide now. Are you seeing yep. ideas, religion, and social change? Okay, perfect. Oh, good. So uh, the title of my presentation is "Ideas, Religion, and Social Change: The Baha'i International Community at the United Nations." So what I'm hoping to do today is to explore this intricate interconnection between ideas that emerge from within a religious community and then how those ideas are understood by the community and then applied in the international and diplomatic arena. Um, this is not a new question. So scholars in the social sciences have been posing this question in various ways as they try to look at how interpretations of teachings uh, in the arena of political life or activism or social justice um, how these are translated um, into efforts uh, aimed at social transformation. And we have examples of extensive scholarship on what is called Catholic social teaching, liberation theology, engaged Buddhism, Jewish social ethics, Islamic ethics. So it's very much in this tradition um, that I felt it was, um, it was really fascinating and timely um, to really look at this fascinating case study that we have within the Baha'i community of a 75 year history of um, very close engagement with um, 
the preeminent international uh, body uh, in the world, the United Nations. So, and of course, we live in a world shaped by ideas that once were radical and dangerous and now seem largely commonplace and unre unremarkable. So we might think of universal suffrage, universal education, racial and gender equality, the system of nation states. Um, so, um, so the question I would love to ask today and to ask you all to think about with me is, what ideas in the world today are the ones that will open up new possibilities for human flourishing? What are these ideas now on the horizon? Um, and what does it look like to try to put um, some of these into, um, into practice? Um, so before we get to the slide, now I, I preempted myself, but I did wanna just give a bit of context to say that this research um, stems from, um, again, um, uh, being at the Baha'i International Community, serving there for 11 years um, as the principal researcher, uh, which actually dates back to 2001 when my internship started there, and really um, having this amazing gift of having a front row seat to, 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 to seeing um, very different processes from what I was reading about in the literature, processes that made me really question how the Baha'i community understands the concept of politics and religion, because it's not something that was reflected in literature about religion um, and social engagement at the time when I was, was looking at it. So in the 2000s, the 2010s. Um, and so this really compelled me to, um, to try to understand this more um, systematically and to try to study it and then to describe it as best I could. So as we move into the presentation, I'd like to focus our attention on four questions that connect this presentation to a much wider conversation about not only religion, but the emergence of a new social, a new social order. And so the four questions that I'm uh, asking us to think about, one has to do with this uh, question of reimagining modernity and thinking about what is the role of religion um, in what we think about as um, the modern um, time in which we live. Uh, second question has to do with agency. Who are the protagonists of the emerging social act uh, order? So who are the actors who are going to, um, to be, uh, be co-creating or are currently um, co-creating um, a new set of structures and processes and ways of being and doing um, that are shaping the world as we know it? The third question, beyond economic man, what values will foster justice and human flourishing in our time? And the fourth question has to do 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 aspirate from aspiration questions as we move forward. Um, so first, uh, and I apologize again for uh, messing up the slides. The next slide. So let's think about first what is the Baha'i international community, since that is the focus of the case study and of the narrative that we're looking at here. So the BIC, as it's known, is the formal representation of the worldwide Baha'i community to the United Nations. Um, it collaborates with uh, UN agencies, with member states, with intergovernmental organization, with non-governmental organizations, with academia and practitioners. Um, and the work of the BIC offices can be broadly described in terms of contributing to policy discourses at the international level. So this means collaborating with individuals, groups, and organizations in a wide variety of social spaces where thought, public opinion, and policy take form and evolve. Uh, the BIC um, is, is part of a, a larger constellation of organizations that work closely with the UN. Um, uh, over 4,000 organizations that formally cooperate with the United Nations. And later, if you have questions, we can talk about what is the nature of that relationship. Um, and finally, I just want to point out that the BIC is part of a family of, um, of offices, and you can see the map insert there. Um, but uh, the Baha'i international community also represents the Baha'i community in intergovernmental spaces in Europe, Africa, um, and, um, and Southeast Asia. So the BIC didn't just emerge out of the blue, of course. Um, I want us to kind of situate ourselves in the historical context from which it, from which it emerges. So it grows um, out of a already a century long um, uh, tradition in the Baha'i faith, which since its inception 
um, has addressed itself not only to rulers, but to the leading thinkers of the day. And here are some uh, brief examples pulled from history just to give us a sense of the narrative. Um, we have the example of Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith um, in the 1860s and 70s, writing tablets to the kings and rulers, um, admonishing them to pursue justice, to abolish slavery, to disarm, to eradicate corruption. Uh, then early in the early 20th century, we have the example of Abdul Baha, who, uh, who leads the Baha'i community um, after the passing of um, his father, Baha'u'llah. And here Baha'u'llah is now carrying the message of peace and solidarity um, to the West um, during a time when the world is beginning to, to, to conceptualize and sort of begin to erect the structures of international peace. And then as we move into the later into the 20th century, we have the continuation of guidance from Shobi Effendi, who um, among the many, many other things um, that he did uh, during his, uh, during his uh, ministry, um, also guides Baha'i engagement, both with the United Nations and its precursor, um, and its precursor, the League of Nations. So with the creation of the UN in 1945, the stage is set for an, an entirely new set of possibilities. The nations of the world you know, emerge from um, the, 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 the tragedy and the horrors of the Second World War and have now assumed um, uh, the task of erecting the architecture for solidarity um, on a global, uh, on a global, um, global level. So um, in this presentation, what uh, you will see, what uh, one of the ways is in that, that I try to approach the question of um, ideas, approaches, and social change is that I try to look at what is the framework um, what are the concepts that are undergirding what the BIC is doing at the United Nations? What is the what is the very um, and I refer to it as the substrate in the book, but that might be uh, uh, not a very welcoming term. But what is it? Uh, what is kind of the DNA, the conceptual DNA from which all of this springs? Um, and while not comprehensive, I have selected three particular elements of a framework um, that I'm going to look at as it weaves. Uh, you know, as it weaves throughout the 75 years of engagement. And so here are the three elements um, that we're going to be looking at. One has to do with a particular view of history. And this is a developmental view of history. So um, from the Baha'i perspective, um, humanity has progressed through developmental stages of childhood. So history is understood as this progression through what could be called our collective childhood and now has reached a threshold of maturity um, we look at the turbulent changes that are taking place in the world as um, two parallel interacting processes. One process, uh, which is destructive in nature and is pulling down um, those structures, ideas, um, ways of, of thinking and being that are no longer serving us um, in, in, in the current day, but then also simultaneous processes of integration where we see the world and uh, communities coming together in new more intense and larger and larger ways. Another element is the principle of the oneness of humanity. Uh, this is very well familiar to the Baha'i community. So this is um, an orientation towards essential relationships making up the social order. Uh, and this idea that um, all of these relationships, whether within the family, among men and women, between governors and the governed, economic relationships, et cetera, uh, these all constitute, uh, these are all understood within the context of uh, of, a, of a spiritual solidarity of humankind. And then the final element um, is the administrative order. Uh, so a unique element of the Baha'i faith. So this refers to the administrative governing and legislative structures at local, national, and international um, levels. Um, specifically, I focus on the Universal House of Justice, um, whose role among, um, among other roles is to safeguard the unity of the Baha'i community and as it's stated in the Constitution of the House of Justice, to maintain the integrity and the flexibility of the Baha'i teachings. And um, we are going to look a lot at um, what that means. All right, so as we, as we move through um, insights generated from the 75 years of history, we're going to look at four periods of history. This is one way that I've kind of broken up um, uh, the history that allows us to look at how the BIC was responding to particular and unique exigencies at any given time um, in its history of cooperation with the UN. As, uh, and as you can imagine, the 40s and 50s and 60s were very different from the 70s and 80s, and in turn different from the 80s and 90s. And so we're moving through 
a very turbulent time in the history of of humanity where uh, the UN is really you know challenged at every turn to address um, existential and all kinds of threats um, uh, facing humanity. Um, so we begin then, uh, the first period is 1945 to 1970, and we're going to look at how the Baha'i view of history shapes uh, the engagement um, at that time. Then we're going to move into the second period, 1970 to 86, and here we're going to look at how is the BIC responding to an intense period of persecution of the Baha'i community, while at the same time, uh, there is this dramatic acceleration um, in the work towards gender equality. In the following period, 86 to 2008, um, this is a period uh, which is really defined by uh, 1986, the UN names 1986 as the International Year of Peace, and peace uh, becomes the overarching focus for much of the work of the BIC, and we're going to look at what is peace, how does the BIC understand that, and then we come to the final period, which brings us to 2020, but actually also just more into the present, when we look at this new turn of uh, thinking about the work of the BIC in terms of participation um, in the discourses of, um, of society. So then the question, so how does a particular view of history shape how Baha'is are thinking about the UN? Why, why is a view of history so central to how we think about engaging in um, in, in political processes. And interestingly, you know, there are many ways of looking at the, uh, looking at and analyzing the UN. And I think what the BIC and what the Baha'is bring to an understanding of international processes, um, is, is this very, is this very long lens of history. And we see, for example, in a letter from a BIC representative to the National Spiritual Assemblies in the 1970s, stating that the United Nations is a mere beginning. If Baha'is can view the UN as an expression of the power of unity released into the world by the Bab, who is the forerunner of Baha'u'llah, and Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, they will see the UN in a different light. They can instead view it as an evidence of the gradual awakening of man's consciousness to the essential need um, for the unity um, of humankind. And so what we see here is that there's this civilizational trajectory that, um, that is being brought to this. And what the longer view does is it not only sees things as they are, and admittedly, there was, there was, there was much to be desired, even from the very beginnings of the UN. You know, it was 50 nation states, uh, 50 member states signing the declaration. There were still many countries who were not yet members, of course, uh, we're well aware of the flaws and shortcomings, the fatal flaws and shortcomings of the League of Nations. So we could take a more short-term view, but the longer view, I think, allows one to look at the potential that is um, that is embedded um, within something like the United Nations uh, and what that represents, uh, what that represents for uh, for humanity. And so already from the very earliest days. So here you see a photo of a delegation signing the charter. Famously, June 26, 1945. Um, even from the earliest days, as early as 1946-47, Baha'is and some other early civil society um, organizations are already starting to participate in these global issue discourses. And so here's an excerpt of uh, the uh, Declaration of Human Obligations and Rights, which the Baha'i community submits to the UN um, as the UN um, is drafting the Universal Declaration of human rights. Um, and so already here's a commentary on the role of the nation state. And uh, the document states, the true destiny of the national state is to build the bridge from local autonomy to world unity, it can preserve its moral heritage and function only as it contributes to the establishment of a sovereign world. Both state and people are needed to serve as the strong pillar supporting the new institutions, reflecting the full and final expression of human relationships in an ordered society. Um, so even in this excerpt, we see a reflection of this consciousness of the oneness of humanity. Um, we see a reflection of this um, particular historical understanding um, and the fact that even from these earliest days, um, civil society is able to, um, to be part of this conversation, even in very limited ways. Um, we see here Baha'i delegates uh, to the UN International Conference. This is in 1949. Um, and it is interesting to add that it was not usual for delegations to be this um, diverse 
um, early on. Most delegates, um, as are described in various UN literature, were um, European men or American men. And Baha'is were, I think, from the very beginning, striving and practicing and already striving to present um, the face of a new community that was coming into being um, and striving to work across um, across national boundaries and representing um, a global a global perspective. So I don't want to dwell too much on this first period because there's a lot to say um, for the other more recent periods. We can certainly go back to it. Um, so then we progress into 1970 to 1986. 1970 is the demarcated year. That is the year where uh, the BIC achieves formal, what is called consultative status with the UN. That is a very big deal. Um, it has come after many years of efforts. Um, so that's why that's the demarcating year. But so let's see what's happening uh, in 1970. So in this period, this is the most dramatic uh, period of the four uh, in, in, in many ways. So the BIC is thrust into engaging with the UN and with the entire global diplomatic community as a matter of necessity and urgency during this period in light of widespread, pernicious, um, and quite brutal persecution of the Baha'i community in Iran. By the 1980s, the plight of the Baha'is is recognized as one of the most severe cases of religious persecution in the world. Um, for those of you who, uh, who may know this a little bit more closely, um, the Baha'is were not accorded legal status in the um, Iranian um, constitution. So they faced violence, torture, the destruction of property, incriminating propaganda. Um, it was even a juridical decision at the time that killing a Baha'i was not. So it's much earlier in the development of the international legal framework. So the question to explore here is then, how does a community seek to protect itself and struggle for justice um, with the threat of its own extermination without reproducing the antagonism and conflict inflicted upon them? So um, again, thinking back to, so where is the international architecture and human rights machinery during that time? So NGO advocacy is also in its infancy. The major global conferences are still several decades away. The transnational networks are just starting to form. Um, and the UN diplomats and representatives are largely unfamiliar with the Baha'i faith and its community. So, you know, not a great starting position um, when you're facing this level of urgency. Um, as I mentioned, various human rights bodies don't even yet have procedural frameworks in place and are taking a very ad hoc approach. Um, but, but things are moving. So the human rights system is evolving. And during this time, um, the landmark declaration on the elimination of all forms of intolerance based on religion and belief comes into being as does the Convention Against Torture. So very gradually, almost just in time, this machinery, um, uh, this machinery is created. So what is the BIC response? Well, uh, as the Universal House of Justice has stated, quote, the proper response to oppression is neither to succumb in resignation nor to take the characteristics of the oppressor. So we need to understand the response from several perspectives. On the one hand, um, BIC, um, BIC provides um, an instrument through which to access legal recourse. Um, and, um, and at the same time, uh, BIC and the Baha'is in Iran are part of a worldwide Baha'i community, which is also very quickly having to learn how to move and advocate together as a unified body and to speak as one community in the international arena. And something really amazing um, happens, uh, but the Baha'is are able to do something that at that time, perhaps no other organization, or maybe one or two, but almost no other organization was able to do, which is to work as a global um, community across over a hundred NSAs um, at a time when um, what was really critical in their defense was the delivery of timely and accurate information to the appropriate UN authorities about what was happening. So this requires coordination, agility, um, you know, flawless accuracy, 
in order to be able to um, also to be seen as a trusted as a trusted source in a world which does not yet know um, the Baha'i community. At the same time, Baha'is are not to resort to partisanship or propaganda or adversarialism. So they're also held to an incredibly high standard of um, of, of 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 ethical um, intervention. So. Um, it is interesting to trace this, and again, we, we can't go into a lot of detail, but just to see how the Baha'i community is using and contributing to the evolution of every single possible international human instrument um, at its disposal and really validating in this way this slow and steady evolution of the international human rights um, framework. In 1985, in a historic General Assembly resolution, uh, the General Assembly identifies Iran as a violator of human rights and calls attention to the plight of Baha'is. Specifically, it marks the first time in which a minority group suffering human rights violations is named in a General Assembly um, resolution. So the Baha'is have been able um, to make their case heard and to bring it to the attention of the international community and to use even the very nascent tools um, um, in order to um, in order to try to, to bring justice and attention to the situation. Um, but then another really fascinating thing is often happening. So as scholars have pointed out, religious communities um, predate national boundaries. You know, they are the first transnationalists, as it's called. Um, and they're themselves active engaged agents in the construction of, um, of the global order. Um, so what we see happening here is that the Baha'i community is not only reacting, but is very actively constructing um, a new kind of international um, uh, international community, international architecture. And so what we want to look at during this time um, is to is to look at um, how the administrative um, how the administrative order, um, which is also coming into being um, at this time, is really lending strength and uh, making possible um, levels of unity and um, collaboration and cooperation, which um, are still very new in the world at that time. So we could see here the developing the development of the Baha'i Administrative Order, 1963 to 1983. So in 1963, we have the first election of the Universal House of Justice. In 1972, during this period that we're looking at, the Constitution of the Universal House of Justice um, uh, comes into being. Just one year later, we have the synopsis and codification of the laws and ordinances of the Kitabi Akdas. Um, and then in 19, um, I'm sorry, that should say 1983 is the completion of the seat of the Universal House of Justice. Um, so again, um, these really dramatic uh, developments taking place at the same time as the Baha'i community is striving to um, is, is striving to um, to defend itself in the international um arena. Also, at the same time, we have um, an expansion of the Baha'i community. So um, the number of national spiritual assemblies increases from 101 at the start of this period, 1970, to 148. Um, and each NSA, um, as it comes into being, becomes an affiliate of the BIC, and therefore the BIC um, is representing now to the United Nations a much larger um, portion of the global community um, and also, um, and uh, there's also this kind of more complex coordination um, that is going on. And here are some photos you can see of the NSAs that came into being during this time. So Tuvalu, St. Lucia, Bermuda, Sierra Leone, um, and Togo, just to name a few. Um, at the same time, so because nothing just ever happens on its own. There are always many, many different um, advancements or setbacks happening at the same time. Um, but during this period, uh, 1975 is also when the United Nations um, uh, focuses very much on the advancement of women. So 1975, the first UN World Conference on Women is held. And in 1975, the Universal House of Justice designates this also as um, International, uh, International Women's Year. Um, you can see here in the photo Baha'i delegates to the uh, to the second UN World Conference on Women. These were taking place every 10 years. Um, and um, so one interesting thing that I want to uh, hold up during this period, again, as we're thinking about the role of the administrative order, um, for example, 
in the manner in which the Baha'i community engages. Um, so during this time, then, as the UN is uh, focusing on uh, advancement of women, there's a large demand for information about the status and condition of women around the world. And the UN looks to NGOs um, to rise to this challenge to provide this information. So the Baha'i community, um, like a good citizen, responds and surveys over 100 um, NSAs about the attitudes of men and women, and how women are participating in Baha'i community life. And based on the responses that it receives, a very interesting uh, piece of information comes to light, which is that um, communities are reporting that um, um, that participation in the processes of Baha'i community governance um, has the strongest influence on the level of women's engagement in all facets of community life, which is to say that um, the structure of Baha'i communities, the structure itself um, is, 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 is organized in such a way that it provides access, that women are easily able to enter um, into various roles in community life. And we see women being elected for the first time to local governing councils, the local spiritual assemblies, national spiritual assemblies. Um, and already by 1975, women were elected to a majority of national spiritual assemblies in Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Americas. So um, again, this interesting insight about um, the administrative order itself, the structure of community life being something that is enabling um, women's participation. So I want to um, I want to ask Boyd to play um, the first um, excerpt. Um, we're going to watch a very short video, which uh, uh, made by the BIC, which really tells the story of very briefly, just in two minutes, the story of the women's movement and it gaining momentum during this time. So Boyd, if I could ask you um, to do that and let me know if I should stop my share. An open letter to the women of the world from the women delegates and advisors at the First Assembly of the United Nations. We call on the governments of the world to encourage women everywhere to take a more active part in national and international affairs. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights may well become the international Magna Carta of all men everywhere. We have learned valuable lessons in the past five years. The attitudinal prejudices which stand in the way of women's advancement are held by women as well as by men. Time is short for us to rectify the present unsustainable patterns. We must achieve greater equality. We have proposed an equal rights amendment. Those delegations who are in favor of draft resolution one entitled The Role of Women in the Preparation of Societies for Life and Peace. Raise their hands, please. The women's movement is about changes in a society, about changes that are global. We want this to be remembered as a conference of women, by women, and for women. I declare open the 41st session of the Commission on the Status of Women. We have to give real meaning to the ideals of women's equality. This has been a century of women's emancipation. KJ was something we all share. Today, we all own the great responsibility of implementing the platform for action. The first 63 years have been momentous. Today, let us be clear about what needs to change. Thanks, Boyd. Thank you so much. I'm going to, um, so there you could see, I mean, one of the reasons for including that video clip um, is to really let you, you see, see that, that um, to concretize uh, the work um, that was taking place and just to show that, you know, really these are people. Um, across the world at the heart of um, at the heart of advancing these ideas and putting them into practice um, and it just gives you a sense of the of the of the momentum of the sheer scale 
and uh, all of the different um, facets that you could see represented in that video clip um, that are involved in um, in the efforts of, of working towards gender equality during that time, still in the um, earlier years of, um, of advocacy. So going back to, um, to sharing my slide, I hope you can see, um, okay, I hope you could see the screen with the four different uh, sets of dates. Yes, so we're moving now in, okay. We're moving now into the third period, uh, the title of which is Beyond Peace, The Greater Trajectory for Social, uh, for Social Development. Again, it's demarcated by 1986. That is the year declared by the United Nations as the International Year of Peace. It is also the year uh, that the um, Baha'i world, um, the Universal House of Justice addresses for the first time the people of the world in its statement, The Promise of World Peace. So as we're thinking about piece here. Um, so I thought this statement is very apt to open up this, this part of the, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the narrative, which is that peace is widely referred to, but rarely defined. So if we are thinking about uh, what the Baha'i community is doing in the arena of peace, we really need to first pause and think about what is the Baha'i conception of peace. And of course, many scholars, communities, have written about the epistemology of peace, um, the ideas about emancipation, knowledge, power, and identity all associated with peace. And peace, of course, is not, um, uh, and it highlights the fact that peace is not a homogenous concept. And there are also many different theories that shape notions of peace, whether realism, Marxism, social constructivism, the concept of the liberal peace. Um, we're also entering a time uh, uh, in, in global history of seismic shifts politically and socially. So it's during this period that we would see the Chernobyl disaster, the fall of the Berlin Wall, at Tiananmen Square, the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, so all of these, uh, these dramatic, uh, dramatic changes are taking place. And here we see the Baha'i community um, is trying to introduce um, um, a set of uh, concepts and ideas and practices related to, um, uh, related to peace. So we see in, this, in the peace statement, um, an excerpt from the peace statement, um, which I'll read, it states that permanent peace among nations is an essential stage, but not, Baha'u'llah asserts, the ultimate goal of the social development of humanity. Beyond the initial armistice forced upon the world by the fear of nuclear holocaust, beyond the political peace reluctantly entered into by suspicious rival nations, Beyond pragmatic arrangements for security and coexistence lies the crowning goal, the unification of all the peoples of the world into one um, universal family. And in this photo, you can see um, Ruhia Hanum presenting the Baha'i Community Statement Promise of World Peace statement to the then UN Secretary General Javier Perez de Cuellar. Um, I believe that about 2 million copies of this statement were distributed and it gave an, uh, by Baha'is around the world. Uh, and it really gave an opportunity for Baha'i communities to enter into conversations, both with um, uh, you know, government representatives, local representatives, about the question of peace and um, what are the elements, um, what are the elements of peace from a human, uh, from a, from a Baha'i um, perspective. So let's look at this framework and let's see what this conception of peace um, looks like. So if we were to draw, um, and this has been, there have been um, um, a, a number of other Baha'is who have looked at this question uh, very closely. There is a book by um, Drs. Hoda Mahmoudi and Janet Khan, uh, which was published last year, I believe, on um, Abdul Baha's, um, uh, his conception of, um, his ideas about the Baha'i conception of uh, peace. So that is also, I refer you um, also to that um, for a deeper treatment of the subject. But for our purposes here and thinking about what is the Baha'i international community doing? So we have um, several elements which are now coming to the fore, several dimensions of peace, which are considered really essential. One is the question of identity, uh, which is that uh, we're now thinking about the importance of fostering a sense of belonging to and concern for the well-being of the human race, that there's an identity dimension of peace. There's the question of unification of the political machinery of the trade, finance, script, language, and spiritual aspiration, um, making um, cooperation, a deeper cooperation on a global scale much more possible. Um, there is the element of diversity, which is peace must be rooted in the diversity of culture, climate, history, language, and thought. There is an institutional 
element, um, institutional reform to enable justice, collaboration, and governance at a global level um, in such a way that uh, the excesses of centralization are avoided as the excesses of uniformity. Um, there's a question of approach, too, that there must be coherence between the means and ends of social transformation, and also the question of the who. Who is it that is bringing about uh, these processes and participating in the construction of peace? And we have uh, this concept of individuals, communities, and institutions, and the fact that all men, all human beings have been created to carry forward an ever-advancing um, civilization. Um, so all of these concepts are informing uh, the contributions of the Baha'i international community um, at this time. And um, again, thinking about, uh, as we've been thinking about the developmental view of history and the oneness of um, humanity as being sort of key um, elements of Baha'i contributions, these also provide a lens um, through which to understand and to read um, the processes going on at this time. And what we see during this period are these um, uh, huge um, conferences which are bringing together unprecedented numbers of heads of state um, and NGO representatives to deliberate on the pressing issues of the day. And these are really landmark conferences which signal the um, world's ability to come together and consult um, on these issues. Now, of course, the, the, the results and the implementation are another story that leaves a lot to be desired, but the fact of um, coming together for this conversation is a step which is, uh, which is significant from, again, from a perspective of thinking about the development of capacity for, um, for global collaboration. So here you see some images from the Earth Summit in 1992. Um, there is a peace monument uh, that the Baha'is spearhead the erection of the peace monument at the Earth Summit, whereby um, uh, some soil from various different countries is deposited into the monument, so symbolically um, representing the, um, the unity of humankind. Sorry about that. Um, we see also in the bottom right the UN World Summit for Social Development in 1995, which brought together 177 heads of state. Um, and there's an excerpt here from the declaration from that summit, which states that for the first time in history, we gather as heads of state to recognize the significance of social development and human well-being um, for all. So a lot of first time um, uh, declarations, acknowledgments are made, including also the spiritual um, elements of social development, which were also widely acknowledged, um, which were also widely acknowledged uh, during that time. Um, we see also here the, um, uh, uh, the UN Fourth World Conference on Women, also a, a landmark uh, conference, which yields, which results in the Platform for Action, which is seen as a, a human rights charter for women signed by 189 countries um, and um, outlines the agenda for um, action on women's rights um, in, the, in the decades to come. So, Again, when we think about, so how is then, yeah, what is the BIC doing? How is it, um, how is it approaching the pursuit of peace since we spoke about the coherence of means and ends? Um, so one of the ways in which it is acting um, and engaging during this time is by sharing ideas, by sharing a new interpretive frame. So looking at various global challenges with a very much a global orientation, trying to cast um, issues and obstacles and challenges um, in the light of, um, of global exigencies. Um, it is also putting forward a relational ontology, so really foregrounding and highlighting the importance of reconceptualizing relationships at all levels of society. And again, there's a developmental perspective of understanding us as humanity coming forward, um, possessing new capacities um, as we learn to work together. Um, if you look at the, the bottom left, so sharing insights from Baha'i efforts around the world. So these are kind of the early, um, early efforts to, to demonstrate to the United Nations what some of these ideals are looking like, what fruit they bear concretely in communities around the world. These are still early days of Baha'i social development, um, but this is starting to be shared. There's also this important element of building capacity for collective action. So we see the Baha'i community strengthening its own internal capacity um, to work together in an, in an agile, coherent, um, coherent way and strengthening its ability to speak um, with one voice. But also we see um, the, uh, the Baha'i community paying a lot of attention to the culture um, 
um, the culture of deliberative spaces at the UN. So if you see at the bottom, fostering a culture of principled deliberation. Um, so striving um, themselves in the various spaces in which Baha'is are present, striving to discover that precious point of unity amongst the incredible diversity in various UN committees and task forces and spaces where contrasting perspectives overlap and around which contending peoples can coalesce. Any of you perhaps recognize that excerpt from the House of Justice um, letter. So we're continually striving to build capacity um, to act um, collectively, um, again, in developing its own internal capacity, but then also shoulder to shoulder um, with others um, at the UN. And um, Boyd, if you could play that brief excerpt. Um, so here's an excerpt where we have um, uh, Mary Power, so a representative to the United Nations from uh, 1975 to 1997, um, who was um, at the forefront of efforts to advance gender equality, um, speaking just very briefly about the contribution of the Baha'i community, specifically on the theme of the girl child, um, at a time when the needs of girls um, were nearly invisible on the global agenda. So Boyd, if you could um, uh, just quickly play that for us. Thank you. Really, it was just the beginning when I was at the UN. We made a statement on the importance of the girl child and the importance of educating the girl child. To the Commission on the Status of Women in 1974, and uh, there was really not a lot of reaction to it at that time. However, when I was in Beijing for the Fourth World Conference, it became part of the program of action. That was another step forward. It was really a thrilling moment. It was, it was the influencing the process to the ultimate. And the director of the Office for the Advancement of Women at the UN came up to me and we high five. <laughs> it was really a victory. It took time. Everything takes time. It's process, process, process. Yes. But it was a wonderful moment. Thank you, Boyd. So in that, um, in that excerpt, you also see um, three amazing women marry three generations, actually, of Baha'i representatives uh, to the United Nations. Mary Power, um, who served from, as I mentioned, from 1975. Um, Bonnie Dougal, current principal representative of the United Nations, and Safir Rameshwar, all of whom um, have, um, have uh, been, as I said, at the forefront of so much work related to what the BIC does. Um, for the advancement of gender um, equality. And you see Mary Power talking about, um, again, the very human dimension of the process of bringing something to the attention and to the agenda of the international community. Um, and uh, the fact that these things take time, took takes time. So it took some 20 years for really the, 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 the issue of the girl child to be fully um, incorporated and paid attention to. Um, but um, it was among um, one of the elements uh, that was brought uh, to to the attention of the UN by the by the Baha'i community. So uh, continuing to um, in our show, so we have Mary Power. Um, all right, so now we um, approach. We get to the final, uh, the current stage um, of, I guess, demarcated by me. Others might might subdivide this differently, but um, in this particular period of the history of the BIC from 2008 to current, um, it's titled Beyond Pluralism, Participation um, in the Discourses of Society. Um, so here, uh, so during this time, the Universal House of Justice um, introduces a new terminology uh, and a new way for the Baha'i international community to describe and to conceptualize um, its engagement on the world stage and the term participation in the discourses of society, which I think is now um, increasingly well known to the Baha'i community, um, begins to be the, the, the manner in which we kind of conceptualize what that, what that engagement is. Um, and we can see here, I want to just um, give two brief quotes to kind of um, to, uh, to, to, to give more context to this. So we see in 2013, when the Baha'is are reporting 
um, on their own work reporting in their report to the UN, they write, attitudes, thoughts, and conceptions of fundamental issues need to be reshaped as a truly global community emerges and develops in its understanding of the nature of human flourishing, as well as the social and material conditions required for such a flourishing. We believe then that a key part of the transformation that is required must occur at the level of thought. And um, another excerpt that I, I think is very um, illustrative in terms of what, what does that participation look like and what is the spirit with which uh, Baha'is um, approach this kind of engagement. Um, there's an excerpt from um, a statement by Bonnie Dougal, which states that we must acknowledge that none of us, no group, no individual, no country, no leader, actually knows what a society that is truly based on the principles of gender equality looks like. And you could sub in other issues for where it says gender equality. In this case, Bonnie is talking about gender equality. Such a society has never existed. Therefore, while we may be able to identify some of the obstacles stemming gender equality in our current paradigm, we have to learn our way towards a new paradigm where gender equality is the norm. And so again, one of the operating um, the principles um, underlying the approach here is one of um, is one of learning because again we are moving into uh, an unknown reality. We are creating a new social reality. As uh, in this case, um, we advocate for gender equality uh, again without without having the example of any one particular society that uh, we feel has achieved this um, has achieved this perfectly. So. Um, so just to concretize this, it's important to remember that when we talk about participation in discourse of society or the consultative mode, that the differences that are encountered in these consultations are real uh, and sometimes extremely difficult to overcome um, and to work with. So there are differences in approach that different um, um, member states or committee members or NGOs might take. Um, there are definitely uh, patterns of adversarialism, of partisanship, um, or even fundamentalism that creep in um, and that are present. Um, and it's difficult um, to work with um, with countries or NGOs, um, on you know, with whom Baha'is might not be completely aligned on some issues, but perhaps are aligned on others. But um, one of the one of the characteristics of, of this approach is really seeking to um, is really seeking to be the well-wishers of all, of striving to harmonize diverse um, perspectives and also knowing in what areas it is constructive and timely to contribute to and which discourses may be too fractioned um, and too contentious, uh, which, um, and, which are set up in such a way that um, it, is not, it is not possible or wise to be, um, to be involved um, at this time. So, um, and again, so speaking to this, uh, the, the importance of harmonizing perspectives in its 2020 letter, the House of Justice has stated that whether through deeds or words, the merit of your every contribution to social well-being lies first in your resolute commitment to discover that precious point of unity where contrasting perspectives overlap and around which contending peoples can coalesce. And so some people, you know, when they learn about the... Um, uh, the fact that Baha'is, you know, eschew partisanship and, you know, are very careful about which spaces they engage in. Um, there's a question around, well, you know, does that hinder you from being able to contribute um, because, you know, because you're holding yourself to the standard? But in fact, when we look, um, you know, more empirically to see how have Baha'is been involved, we actually see a pattern of Baha'is being consistently invited to or elected to or appointed to positions in which they are in a facilitative or leadership role. Um, so you see on the right of the screen, um, there's just a selected, uh, not an exhausted list of the different spaces in which um, Baha'is have had the opportunity um, to play that role, whether it's the Faith and Feminism Working Group to the United Nations, the Interagency Network on Youth Development, the Multi-Faith Advisory Council to the UN, the NGO Committee on the Status of Women, NGO Committee on UNICEF, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, NGO Committee for Social Development. So many, many examples, um, which I think provide um, 
a way to demonstrate the response of the UN community to this particular um, approach, which is to say that it functions well. It enables committees and task forces to, um, uh, and certainly Baha'is are not um, taking all of the credit, but, but there is an attention to process and an attention to the culture of deliberation and, and, and to the manner in which conversations unfold and how people um, kind of, you know, go through, um, go through the space. So I wanted to um, end the presentation, I know I've talked for a long time, by offering three concrete examples of what this um, participation um, looks like today. Um, and I want to start with uh, the example of um, uh, the example of the, uh, the contribution to the uh, discourse on global governance. So on the UN 75th anniversary, the BIC launched a statement um, looking at the question of governance, putting forward ideas. And I think what you'll see in this short clip, which I'm going to ask Boyd to play in a minute, is um, the manner of engagement is really evolving, but also adapting to the fact that we were in the middle of a pandemic and it was difficult to meet um, in person. But you see here um, different uh, voices, different partners, different collaborators um, at the UN um, really engaging with, commenting on um, the ideas in the statement and kind of a process of mutual, um, of mutual learning um, and, and a process that um, you know, stimulates consultative processes um, that the that um, that uh, BIC representatives are striving to do. So, Boyd, if I could ask you to play that um, that video, please. I'll stop my screen share. embedded in the messages of the Baha'i community. And I want to focus on the importance of religious actors in forging those global coalitions. Their role is very important in areas such as development, education, health, and so on. Today, at the UN, we count on a very innovative body, which is the Multi-Faith Advisory Council, it's the first step so as the religious voices are heard at the United Nations. And it happens that that body is chaired by the Baha'i community and its representative, Bani Dugal. A statement that speaks powerfully to the moment of now and to the needs that every single human being on this earth and every single institution actually very much needs. The Baha'i faith has always inspired me to understand something that is fundamental to all faith traditions around the world. The acknowledgement, the recognition, the necessity of serving the fact that we are all one. Our survival on this planet, the planet's survival, is fundamentally dependent on whether or not we will get this very simple fact deep into our systems. We thrive when we are one. We self-destruct when we believe that our boundaries matter. Boyd, I think we can stop there just in the interest of time. Thank you. I know that we're already going on to one hour, so I want to just uh, maybe just um, get to the get to the end um, a little bit faster. Um, so the other example I want to give is um, examples surrounding the work on the uh, UN 75 People's Forum for the UN. Um, so this was uh, the UN 75 People's Declaration and Plan for Global Action. I hope you are seeing um, this slide. So it provides an example of what it means to be um, what's often referred to as the pen holder in these situations, where in this case, BIC was invited to lead 
the drafting process of the civil society's position for the 75th anniversary of the UN. This, as you can imagine, is a process that um, involves um, you know, as large as possible, a diversity of, of, of input, of NGOs, um, of a huge diversity of perspectives. And it almost seems unfair to ask civil society to speak with one voice because uh, there are so many different uh, different things to be conveyed. So almost an impossible task, I think. But uh, nonetheless, it was a multi-month uh, process which paralleled the member states' development of their political declaration. Hundreds of civil society organizations were engaged, including perspectives from as I mentioned, indigenous populations, women, youth. And so the challenge here, as in any committee, but this is particularly complex, was how do you find the points of unity? How do you ensure that people feel heard and represented in the process um, and in the document? And um, an interesting shift kind of took place, as this was um, relayed to me by um, one of the representatives, that um, rather than thinking about a laundry list of what various groups wanted, um, there was a shift from kind of an interest group identity to a human identity. And eventually throughout the course of um, many, many consultations um, and iterations of this document, um, the group was able to come to a consensus and to focus on the interests uh, and needs of humanity as a whole. Um, the tone also um, in the final document was much more um, open rather than prescriptive. Um, so rather than demanding things from, from, from governments, it presented recommendations and suggestions. Uh, and another, another interesting development was that um, while earlier iterations um, included only asks you know, from governments, the final iteration included commitments of civil society. Um, so again, thinking of civil society um, conscious of itself as a protagonist um, in, this, um, in this process. Um, so again, this provides, I wanted to provide you with a concrete example of what are some of the different roles um, that are played and what are some of the ways that um, Baha'is can really put into practice um, some of those, um, some of those uh, principles which we've been talking about. And then the final example with which I will conclude my presentation is um, it, it wouldn't be fair to end the, uh, without really acknowledging the, um, the role that the BIC has played in the gender equality discourse um, really for the past, um, I think, four decades, um, BIC representatives have been um, intimately and closely involved with um, uh, UN efforts um, uh, to advance gender equality at all levels. And um, this year on the 25th anniversary of the historic Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, which emerged from the Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing, and as I mentioned before, was the human rights, became the Human Rights Charter for Women. Um, this film reflects on the global advances towards gender equality, and then also draws on examples from Baha'i-inspired community building efforts um, around, um, around the world. It's also important to acknowledge that, um, again, as we talk about participation in discourses, that um, this is not kumbaya all the time. So there are true, sometimes very deep-rooted, um, ideological differences that um, enter into these spaces, many different ways of thinking about the equality of women and men. Um, it is often controversial as to whether religions should be at the table. Um, so the secular religious um, divide can also be something real. Um, and so this uh, presents a very interesting test case um, for the kinds of values and principles that we're talking about um, and, and, and the challenge of um, creating an enabling environment for harmonizing for harmonizing perspectives. So I, I, I wanna share, um, maybe we'll just share one, uh, one clip. Um, and this also represents an evolution in the way that Baha'is are able to contribute because as the Baha'i community around the world um, is maturing, um, there's more and more um, stories, narratives, and examples that can be shared with the international um, community. So it's interesting for us to think about the profound connections between the conversations and the activities at the community level in our very communities that the Baha'i community is able to learn from. And as it synthesizes and analyzes and reflects on these experiences, um, these experiences eventually can find their way um, into, um, into discourses of global, um, of global import. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna close with um, an excerpt from a community in um, Malaysia and uh, members of that community discussing some of the profound shifts in thinking that have taken place.
Um, so Boyd, if you could just play that and we can stop after that excerpt, please. Thank you. Previously, according to our community culture and practices, men didn't really have trust in the capacity of the women in terms of their ability to contribute to opinions and knowledge. But gradually, women have shown their capacity and are now known as equal to men. Men are also gaining trust towards women. As village leaders, we have many responsibilities and are not only concerned with the education and religion of the villagers, but we are also concerned with the empowerment of women. Women are regarded as an important component of the community. This village will not develop further without women. Women help us to reach higher nobility. Thanks, Boyd. I think we can we can stop it at that point. That's wonderful. Thank you. All right. So with that, um, we are um, here nearing the end. Uh, I want to return. Um, I just want to say also what a beautiful uh, film that is. I encourage all of you have not yet, if you have not yet seen glimpses into the spirit of gender equality to please run out and view it. Um, it is a beautiful and thought provoking um, statement on um, the efforts to work towards gender equality um, at all levels. So for the final, uh, final slide, I want to come back to our initial four questions and leave you with some thoughts and with that, close the presentation. Um, so as we look at the four questions that we started with, the question of reimagining modernity, what is the role of religion? Some things to think about um, uh, from based on the, the, the research of the BIC at the United Nations, we can see that one of the roles is expanding the moral imagination and giving a vision of what is possible. It is also demonstrating alternative and unifying approaches to social change at all levels. So recasting conceptions of power and identity and the ways that we would normally think about social transformation. Uh, this demonstrates um, alternatives. The second question of agency, who are the protagonists of the emerging social order? Um, I would assert that religious communities are not passive actors in the existing social order, but rather they are co-creators of the emerging social order. The third question beyond economic man, what, what values will foster human flourishing in our time? Um, uh, the Baha'i community has been actively involved and encouraging of a reconceptualization of human identity, justice, peace, and collective action in light of the oneness of humanity. And finally, uh, from aspirations to action, how do we collectively translate ideals into action in continually changing circumstances? Because we must talk about action. This is not just at the level of theory and ideas. Um, and one of the um, uh, approaches that the Baha'i community is demonstrating is that um, we are taking a learning orientation. We are learning our way forward um, into this new order um, alongside a growing diversity of collaborators. Um, and um, standing shoulder to shoulder um, with our colleagues um, and others engaged in this work. So with that, I will close. Thank you so much um, for your attention and um, over to you, Rob. Thank you so much. It was really incredible, uh, Julia. Um, just being able to periodize the history of the Baha'i involvement in the UN, being able to see how the concerns of the Baha'i national community have changed 
over such a long period of time, and then seeing how we've been able to contribute to the changes that have occurred in society around the world. It's really, really a fantastic uh, chance to, to learn about these, these subjects and to discover really what we've been able to accomplish. And I, I, I'm very grateful. And thank you again for this uh, marvelous presentation. Uh, we have some questions. We have a lot of comments in chat. We have some Q and A's as well. Uh, sometimes people try to raise their hand and I wanna tell people not to bother to do that because that's mostly useful if we can turn on your cameras and microphones, but we have too many people today and we're not going to try to do that. So please post your questions either in the chat or in the Q and A. And mm -hmm. I will start by opening the Q and A and then I will also turn to the chat and see what we have uh, in the chat. We had quite had a lot of people on today and they did not drop off by the way, even though the presentation went perhaps longer than we thought. It we did go long. The entire audience. So um, please keep Thank that. you all. That means a lot. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, well, people have been asking about the availability of the slideshow and of course in the recording, we will have the uh, recording up on our YouTube channel and whenever we send out Wilmot Institute publicity, we always include the links to the most recent webinars there. And with Julia's permission, if she shares with us the slideshow, we will be glad to put that up on uh, the website for this particular talk. And then anyone will be able to download it uh, whenever they want to. So uh, that will be, it will be available. Mm -hmm. um, so that answers some questions right away that we've had. Uh, Philip. In, in the UK says, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I'm looking forward to your book. You've spoken about the principle of the oneness of humanity of humankind as about the different forms of relationships. In the world order of Baha'u'llah, uh, he then quotes something about the principle of oneness of mankind is not just an outburst of ignorant emotionalism or an expression of vague and pious hope. And, he, and it's that marvelous quote from the Guardian about its implications being deeper, its claims greater which the prophets of old were allowed to advance. Um, and so he then goes on and asks this question, could you please comment on the last part of the Guardian statement? Its message concerns itself primarily with the nature of those essential relationships that must bind all the states and nations as members of one family. What are the implications of this formulation in how we understand and describe the work with the principle of the oneness of humankind and how does the everyday Baha'i operate with this principle? And how does this principle get expressed in the conceptual framework of the BIC and the ABS? So he's loaded you down with quite a few questions. I think I'm gonna run now. I think, I think this is where I leave the room. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think, first of all, there's an art to posing great questions and there is value in just having a wonderfully articulated question for all of us, even if I don't have an answer. I, I should say that in the ideal world, I could be seated beside all of the current BIC representatives who you know, are absorbed um, in this work day in and day out. Um, so I'm speaking from a kind of a more academic um, vantage point. I think, uh, so this answer is going to be partial because I'm not, um, again, I'm not um, as, um, you know, as, as engaged as the current representatives in that work, but I would say, that um, I think one of the things that sets the Baha'i community apart is this very explicit way in which it addresses itself to the, to the nation state framework and to the nation state um, order. So it's very um, concrete. So when, when Shobi Effendi is talking about this is no mere outburst of ignorant emotionalism, um, you know, and he states um, the, you know, specifically the relationships among nation states, I think that that, um, um, that that invites serious um, reflection for how um, for how intentional the Baha'i community is about the importance of this relationship in the emerging national order. So the fact that um, we are striving for the oneness of humanity in no way takes away from the fact that nation states will continue to exist and there is a role for them. And as, as you recall from the, 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 the first chapter of the history where the Baha'is are already putting forward the view on the role of the nation state and you know, it's it's the conception of sovereignty has already kind of outlived its usefulness. And now we have the nation state as a bridge to global autonomy. Um, um, so I think um, I think there's there's a, there's a highlighting there that um, uh, that is that is unique and that must be taken and that must be taken 
um, seriously. Um, so I would say that. And then the other part of your question was, you know, how did this show up in um, in the framework? I would say that you know we see those relationships alongside um, the, the 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 requirements and exigencies of other relationships, whether it's between men and women, whether it's between the governors and the governed. Um, so there's quite a complexity actually in the vision that is emerging because not only is it calling for the reconceptualization of those relationships, but it's calling for an organic change. Um, but I think it also establishes the, the continued importance of the nation state and the fact that this is not being erased by the call for, for oneness. If I can follow up on that, I'm curious about the concept of the oneness of humanity. We Baha'is, of course, throw the term around and we have a very, I think in many ways, a very concrete idea of what it means. I'm wondering if you can give us any examples of how, hmm, I don't know how shall I put this, how people at the United Nations do not appreciate the concept of the oneness of humanity. So we have a better sense of sort of what that environment is like. Uh, I suppose people have a generalized sense of the oneness of humanity in that they recognize we're all members of the same species, but is it that in many people's day-to-day -day work, that's just simply not important? Or is it a matter mm -hmm. of, of, of being focused on such narrow ad advocacy that it, it doesn't come up in people's minds? I'm curious if you have any, if you can give us any orientation about that. Yeah, I think that's such a good question. And I wish, you know, Daniel Perel and Safira Rameshwar and Bonnie Dougal um, could be here to uh, to comment on that. But I think I think without that belief, I think it would be hard to sustain one's energy and involvement in the United Nations. I think that we might refer to it differently because oneness it, it it's a difficult it's a, it's a difficult term to kind of penetrate. Um, the term that's I think sometimes easier to understand is global solidarity. Um, but, um, uh, I think, so there is more of a comfort level with just different, uh, different language that is used, but I would say without that belief, it would actually be difficult to continue to, to be in that space. And, and I'm speaking more for NGOs. I've never been on a, I, I, it may be different for, um, for, for diplomats because there is of course the, the overarching kind of sovereign, um, sovereignty question, but, um, I, th I think for NGOs from, from my time there, I think it was very much uh, something that was very deeply felt actually and shared. Um, although I think the, 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 the challenging element is one of constituency. So people still see themselves as like, I'm a constituent, my constituency you know, needs this. We need you to pay attention to this. And I think what some of the Baha'i contributions have been, well, we can't practically have a laundry list of a thousand needs of a thousand constituencies. At some point, what is that thing that is going to, what is that higher principle? And how do you move the conversation in that direction in a way that satisfies people where they feel heard? So those are real questions. Fascinating. And uh, Philip did have another question and then I'll turn to the, the chat. He says, it is often that as Baha'is, we are prone to be influenced by the national culture of the country we come from or live in, in recent times, national discourses on migration and immigration are such an example. Can you summarize what the BIC and the Baha'i perspective is on issues of migration and how that perspective is articulated by the principle of the oneness of humanity, oneness of mankind? So the short answer is no, but um, I would say that this is a discourse that is very, uh, prominent in the, the BIC um, representation um, in, in Europe, in the BIC Brussels office. Um, and a lot, of, um, um, a lot of interesting work is being done around bringing people together, bringing different perspectives to the table. So I would say that um, that would be an interesting office to look to, which is not to say that, um, that, the, that the New York office hasn't, um, hasn't said things about it. But um, yeah, I am not able to give a concise um, summary, the BIC website is a wonderful resource and you can search it by theme, you can search it by statement, by news, document, blog post. Um, I do encourage people to, um, to check that out. And is Glimpses also linked at the BIC website? You had mentioned that people want to look at Glimpses and I was curious how people would find it. Yeah, so Glimpses, it can be found um, just by looking at on, on YouTube, but there's also a microsite um, and I could, I, I'll have to find the link. And um, on that microsite, you will see um, a lot of other helpful resources and information. 
Um, I do want to add that the film has won 11 prizes in various film festivals. So it's just lovely to see that it has also been recognized in terms of its, its contributions to these questions. We'll be sure to put uh, that microsite link up on the website for your talk. And I see we do have a couple more comments now on the Q&A. Um, Martine asks, haven't the Scandinavian countries reached gender equality? Hmm. That's such a good, uh, that's such a good question. From my understanding, so there is not a unanimous, you know, view on what gender equality is at the United Nations. There are various schools of thought. Um, so it would really depend on what metric and rubric you are applying. In terms of perfect parity, I don't think there is such a country or community um, that has reached it. But I will also say that there are people looking at um, there is still a lively conversation about, you know, does equality have to do with access or opportunities or outcomes? Is it equality or is there some are there some elements where, you know, should women have more? Should there be some differentiation that makes sense? Um, I think on many markers, the, the, the Nordic countries, um, you know, excel, um, excel other countries. Um, but then I think others might say, well, no one metric is divorced from other metrics. So I think there are social struggles going on in those countries that suggest um, that there are other problems that need to be attended to um, as well. But I would say that there are many different schools of thought about um, gender equality, at, at least among the NGO community. Marsha asks, in learning about what values foster justice and human flourishing, do you know if the experience of the VIC revealed there were a key set of values that made it easier to find points of unity? Hmm. That's a really good, um, that's a really good, um, that's a really good question. And I, I, and again, I think it would be so interesting to hear, um, you know, input from the various uh, uh, from the various representatives. I think, um, yeah, I, I just imagine there would be so many different um, answers to this. I have heard um, uh, in various conversations at the UN people noting that um, that there is a mindset, you know, with which you approach a consultation and a conversation. And if there's a, a mindset which you know allows for the fallibility of one's own views and positions in which you are open and willing to learn, kind of a learning um, mindset that that um, enables for different kinds of conversations to take place. And I think one of the challenges that the UN has to work against is this kind of culture of positionality, of position taking and communicating by way of positions which is difficult because it's built into the structure whereby member states communicate, you know, positions. Um, and I think one of the spaces and the kinds of um, dynamics that the BIC is trying to foster is, is, is spaces where it's safe to explore, where it is safe to actually consult. And, 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 but that sometimes requires you to set aside your, you know, affiliation where you're no longer speaking on behalf of this whole organization, but you're just kind of entering as a person willing to think, um, and consult. So I think that's that's a part of it. That's interesting. Thank you. <clears throat> One more from the Q and A, and then I'll turn to chat. Uh, you mentioned the profound connection at the community level towards the contribution of discourse on the global level. Does this imply that the friends at the community level should also learn from the contributions of the BIC at the global level? Hmm. That's such a good. Um, I would never say one should not, you know, not learn from from something um, or other. But I, I think, I think it is interesting just to think about what what it means for us to be a learning community. That it actually means that um, we have in place the structures and processes that are able to take in insights at the local level and then you know share them um, globally. And I, I and I do think it's important. Um, maybe just even beyond learning about Baha'i contributions at the global level, is just understanding what is the global, um, the global discourse? What are the struggles um, kind of on a global level? What is, what, is, what is the world really struggling with when it comes to gender equality and when it comes to, um, to climate change? So I would say yes, and actually we, it would also be good for us to have that kind of um, 
even broader outlook to understand, you know, what are other voices and concerns in that space. I've heard frequently as advice, if people want to know, well, how do I approach topic X or topic Y in public discourse? People say, well, let's start by looking at the statements of the Baha'i international community. What has the BIC said about this topic, which obviously they've been approved by the House of Justice and their, their solid statements of Baha'i belief. And they're, it seems to me, a very important um, first step uh, when people are trying to figure out exactly what positions they need to be able to explain to people. Yeah, that's such a good point. That's such that 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 is a really good that is a really good point. And of course, we also have the um, uh, the Office of Public Affairs, which is more focused on the U.S., um, which is more focused on the U.S. context. So I would add I would add that as well. Yeah, and uh, turning to the chat now, I'll let people know since everyone can click on the chat that um, Julia has put a link to the book, uh, the book site in the chat. So if anybody wants. To find the book or purchase it, uh, that's probably the place to go. Uh, Ron says this presentation is excellent, and uh, thanks you for that. Uh, we also have already provided there the place where people can find everything later on. Um, going on down here, let's see. Maybe I should just say briefly about the book, because it is always guilt-inducing to know that the cost of the book is... Um, a little bit crazy. It's over $110. It will be sold in soft cover in July, which I believe will be in the 40s. So I just want to say that because um, because of what it is. <laughs> so the way academic publishing is, the the academic publishing complex is a uh, an gen an entire engine of its own, both for the advancement of knowledge and for the advancement of profit. I'm afraid in the society that we live in. And there's not a lot that can be done about it that. It is, it is. Um, let me see if I can find some more questions here. And yeah. Some of these are very long and I probably have to look them over. I read them. So one person says they're inspired. Um, Arthur Dahl, God bless him, mentions the Baha'is were present at the formation of the UN in 1945 in San Francisco. Dale Allen told me that as a 10-year-old, he went around to the desks in the opera house where the event was being held, putting Baha'i literature on each desk. His parents, Jack and Valera Allen, were part of the Baha'i representation. So we have a very wow. connection all Amazing. the way back to 1945. Amazing. In yep. that case. Uh, I don't know whether Dale you know, Allen is still in the position to tell us this story or not, but thank you, uh, Arthur, for passing it on to us. Um, there, there are very interesting accounts in the Baha'i World volumes, in the volume that encompasses, you know, 1944 to 46, about sort of the atmosphere around the San Francisco conference and Baha'is were holding all kinds of, you know, radio broadcasts and just the atmosphere, uh, which I imagine must have been quite quite surreal at the time. But yes, there were Baha'is, there were Jewish organizations, Quakers, many Christian organizations active at that time. Um, Donna says, thank you, Dr. Berger. I need to leave now. Well, your presentation is quite timely as I am attempting to establish a countrywide interfaith women's group to broaden the perspective on humanity as one to those who live in this country. So that's quite a nice... Mm. Uh, Wonderful. Uh, of this. Um, to what extent are we using the media to demonstrate the impact of Baha'i work around the world? Is another question uh, from Gia. You know anything about Yeah, that? I think, well, I, I think if you're, um, I, I think you could see a real evolution on that front, even with Baha'i World News Service and the kinds of, um, um, films and materials that are being produced by the Baha'i international community. Um, it is really, uh, I might describe it as speaking a new language. So we're using this language of, of, of film that is, I think, enabling the story to be told um, in ways that were not possible um, before. And it's enabling um, new kinds and new forms of engagement. Um, so I think there's been um, a tremendous amount of movement on that front. Of course, there's still uh, lots of more things that we could do, but already you could see from glimpses and some of the other footage I shared 
um, it's really exciting what's happening. There is also in the chat a link to where people can find glimpses. So I should mention okay. that people can indeed uh, go there. Of course, we'll still it'd be nice to have the link to put up on your page because people later on will have access to the chat uh, from the recording. So later on, you can, you can pass that on to us. Um, there's also very some very interesting comments here that are very long, and I, I can't really read them right now long, quickly enough to uh, have a sense of whether there's something to present. So I think I will skip them. I had a couple of quick questions myself uh, also. You had identified the year um, 2008 as a mm -hmm. milestone year. And I was curious, you, you had clear events for 1970 and 86, but there was no clear milestone you mentioned for 2008. So is it just sort of a gradual shift or is there a message from the house? That's such a great, I love that question because there was a lot of kind of, pain and mental effort because you, you could say there's some level of sort of arbitrariness, but that is the year when the new language entered the vocabulary of the BIC, participation and discourses. So those were some of the early kind of exchanges between the Baha'i World Center and the BIC. I think it enters more into the wider discourse around 2009, 2010, the Rizwan message um, but that is when we start to become conscious of what we're doing. And so I felt that that shift uh, really merited kind of a new, new break. But thank you. I love that question because yeah. that, was, that was a tricky one. It seems to me that's also roughly dated the so-called Yaren Bowl letter when the House of Justice wrote yes, the National that's right. Assembly and said that focusing on public discourse should be, uh, and maybe social action should be among the uh, main efforts of the Yaren Bowl, the high school in Australia. So that, that, that I was curious because of that as well. And then here's a question which, of course, no one can very easily answer. What will be the next milestone and the next focus? Or are we going to be focusing on discourses of society now? The next well, I did check in with my um, BIC colleagues. I'm like, they're going to ask me this question and I'm going to be stumped. Um, one, one thing we can say is that global governance as an overarching theme will be a theme, as I understand, for the BIC for the, for the foreseeable future. And that is something that is going to, um, to frame much of the work of the BIC. So global governance, um, we can say for sure, of course, the gender equality uh, discourse will continue um, and others remains to be seen every year. The, 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 there's you know, the tremendous amount of reflection and planning that goes on based on the reading of various opportunities and exigencies, but global governance, for sure. Clearly, the nine-year plan with its emphasis on community building and our ongoing, you know, commitment to public discourse, which we started mm -hmm. in 2008, those aren't going to go away. So, yeah, exactly. And clearly, the, the, the focus since 2008 has really been on discourse that relates to community building. So uh, it seems to me that really can't go away in a way, you know, in a way. And the, the, another dimension is the um, humanitarian and disaster response and relief. So there have been some new um, uh, stories coming out of the Baha'i World News Service and some new, um, uh, also um, some new pieces of information posted on the BIC website. I think that's a space where BIC is increasingly contributing and also able to pull examples from Baha'i communities. Um, so I think that's another space that will be, um, will, be, will be focused on, I believe. Makes sense. And here is that Zabine has a, 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 an interesting question here from Seattle. Uh, is the BIC office engaged in the centenary celebration of the international, I guess it's now what, the Tree Foundation, uh, Richard St. Barb Baker, with, uh, and with other words, uh, in other words, in climate change, because he's focused also on climate change. At our Unity Museum in Seattle, we are working with them and have an exhibit sharing with them globally on their website uh, about the... Mm -hmm. Foundation and Sir Richard St. Uh, not Sir uh, uh, Richard St. Barb Baker. I bet Arthur Dahl would know the answer to anything related to any of this. So I wonder if Arthur, if you could post something in the in 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 the chat. Um, uh, uh, so I, I I don't I don't know. Has been revived. I would I wouldn't say necessarily revived, but certainly it's quite strong now with a a new person directing it out of the UK. I know that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I don't see anything yet from Arthur, but Philip says, great questions and answers. So he certainly has appreciated your, your response to his. Thank his you for your questions. Keeping me on my did, toes. How long did the research and writing for this take you? Well, you know, in a way I was, you know, I, I, I'd been actively thinking about how to try to describe what, what the BIC has been doing for, for a long time. And I think um, it, 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 took, it took the PhD to really learn how to think about, learn how to think more about the you know, kind of religion and inter in the international arena, but it's a blur. It's a long time. <laughs> It's, 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 it's a long time. And then the other thing is that the BIC is evolving so quickly now that literally any time I have a chance to speak about the book, um, it requires a lot of, um, a lot of consultations. It's just such an exciting, I mean, the world is, 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 is changing. There are crises and exigencies and all kinds of opportunities for, um, for engagement. And I think the response is happening on so many levels and the representatives are balancing so many different lines of action. It's really incredible and inspiring. Um, so, um, yes, how many, how many week to week. How many representatives of BIC have in New York now? So right now it's four. It's four in New York. And, 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 and that's quite unusual for a non-governmental organization. So BIC is among um, the larger um, NGOs for sure. And I remember being so surprised um, when I came for an internship in 2001, um, in the summer of 2001, and already almost everyone I encountered at the UN knew who the Baha'is were. And I thought, what world am I in? This is amazing. And it just speaks to the fact that Baha'is are able to be present in a lot of spaces and, 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 and to consistently contribute um, and be of help and assistance. Um, so they are very well known. Uh, even though it's a small, four is not a big number, but yeah. they do a, a lot is done. And Arthur says the International Tree Foundation is still active in a number of countries with its own available resources and the International Environment Forum, which he's involved in, is in close mm -hmm. touch with them. So we have that. Oh, wonderful. That's from Arthur. And another Thank question you. we also have from Philip, are there any other books that have been written about the BIC? BIC? Um, I hope not. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> books about the BIC. No, that's a great question. Well, yes, I do want to mention. So um, Nazila Ganea, who lectures at Oxford. So I think in the 1990s, uh, um, published a book called The UN Human Rights, The Baha'is, The UN and Human Rights, which is an um, incredibly impressive um, analysis of what the defense work has been and how the Baha'is have, um, have put forward their case to the UN, um, so that uh, that I am aware of. I hope I'm not forgetting any major books, but there have been articles um, as well. But I think that's the only the only book that is trying to speak to the organization as a whole. Well, I think we're pretty much uh, at the bottom of our list of questions, uh, and people are saying thank you, Cornelia from Somerville, Mass., who's a friend of mine, and says her. <laughs> So thank you. And a friend of mine. Hi, Cornelia. Yes. And uh, so again, thank you so much, Julia. This has been fascinating. And I think something that we will all appreciate for a long time and uh, benefit from as people are able to enjoy the recording. And I want to thank, thank you so audience. much. Thank you. And I want to thank our audience so much for joining us today and remind them that we'll be back in two weeks with another presentation. And then, of course, continuing after that. So we hope everyone has a good weekend and we look forward to seeing you again in this space. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. It's a unity that embraces diversity, uh, diversity of, of, of national, legal, cultural, and, and political traditions but situates it within, within uh, an ethical basis that reminds us of some of the, the, the shared values that, that are uh, intrinsic to, to humans everywhere. Uh, an acknowledgement of interdependence, uh, a shared ethic of, of, of justice that people seek everywhere, and a recognition of, of humanity as one. The statement also recognizes that 
The transformation that, that is ongoing is a, is a gradual process. It's a step-by-step -step process, but every step makes another step possible. Everybody has their own definitions of a global civic ethic. It's great to see it referred to in a governance befitting and how you know, no issue of that scope and significance has challenged us to come together and build uh, not only a uh, global structure, institutions, norms, tools to respond to these challenges, but to have ethical moral principles that underpin these institutions. That's at the heart of a global civic ethic.